So in this video, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last video, and we're going to start with a slightly more complex version of the rocket landing animation um, from the very end of section 1.3 of the second edition of How to Design Programs. And we're going to explore some more refactoring. Again, we're going to try to use the dry principle, do not repeat yourself. And there's lots of repetition in this version of the code. And in this video, we're going to try to clean that up following essentially the same material that's presented in section 1.4 of the prologue, chapter 1, of how to design programs. So let's get started. Over here in the Dr. Racket window, I have copied the animation code from the end of 1.3. And if we run that, we see that indeed our little rocket comes down and lands. All very exciting. Now, as I mentioned, our goal here is to try to reduce repetition in this code. And there is, frankly, quite a lot, ranging from smallish repetition like the fact that the rocket image appears one, two, three, four, five times, and that the constant 100, which is used for both the width and the height of the scene, appears one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, to arguably slightly more complex kinds of repetition, like the fact that this expression, this bit of math, that computes the distance between the center of the rocket and the bottom of the screen, which is the scene, which is important for deciding whether the rocket animation should end or not, the rocket should stop moving. That bit of logic appears one, two, three times. So we're going to go through and do a number of refactorings to try to clean this up. The first thing I'm going to do actually is take care of all of these hundreds. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hundreds, which mean two different things. One of them is the height of the scene, and one of them is the width of the scene. Um, and if we wanted to change either the height or the width of the scene, we'd have a real problem wading through and figuring out which of these are heights, which of these are widths, and changing the right ones. So we're going to go ahead and give them names so that we have the correct, or we have more meaningful descriptions of those constants. Constants like this are often referred to as magic numbers. They are numbers that just appear in the program somewhat magically, and their meaning is not clear or obvious from just looking at the number itself. You have to look at the code around it to decide what that number means and how it's being used. If we instead give it a good name, then it ceases to be so much magic, and more we can you know, look at the name there, and it hopefully will tell us what's going on. So we're going to start by defining the height of the scene. So we'll define height to be 100. Now this is similar to defining a function, but in this case we have open paren define like we do with functions. But instead of having a function prototype like we have here, function name and arguments in parentheses, we just have a name. No parentheses, no arguments, just a name. And then the value that we're assigning to that name. The book tends to use all caps to indicate that we're defining a constant. This value is always 100. Um, but Racket doesn't really care about that. That's simply a human convention to try to indicate this is a constant and not something else. Um, but you don't have to do all caps if you don't want to. I'll go ahead and follow the book on this. Um, I think it's not an unuseful thing to do. But by no means is it a required thing to do. And now, have, having defined height, I need to figure out which of these hundreds represent the height of the scene. So this one looks like it because it's doing some math about image height and height, so that seems pretty plausible. And then there's another hundred here that's doing the same kind of thing. And there's another hundred here that's doing the same kind of thing. So the other occurrences of a hundred are here and here and here and here. An empty scene takes its arguments as width followed by height. So this is this second argument to empty scene is the height, and this second argument to the empty scene is the height. And so we should, if we got it right, be able to run this again, and we should get the same animation. And we do. <laughs> 
Now, later on in the course, we'll see how to do automated tests so that we can check that refactorings like this haven't broken our program without actually having to run the whole program again. Um, but for the moment, all we've got to work with is running the program and seeing that it does the right animation. So now I've eliminated most of the hundreds, but I still have this one and this one, both of which represent the width of the scene. So I'm going to go ahead and define width. And then I'll replace this hundred with width and this hundred with width and save and run and we landed. And now at this point, by just defining these two constants, we've actually made the code quite a lot more readable. We now know that this, this, and this are about the height of the image. And we also now know that this is the width and this is the height of the scene, which if we don't remember the order of the arguments to empty scene, and I didn't, I had to go look it up, uh, that tells us that this is the width, assuming we've chosen good names, and this is the height. And that's a good thing. And so if we wish to change the size of the scene and maybe make the scene 300 by 150, Boom. The scene is now 300 by 150, and the rocket still lands correctly, and we didn't have to change a zillion places where those numbers appeared. We just had to change them in one place, and that's really a huge win. I'm going to go ahead and put these back to 100. Uh, so we've made a huge improvement already just by defining two constants. There's one other constant I want to define. And that is the rocket itself. The rocket appears five times. One, two, three, four, five. And it's visually clear that it's being repeated. And to put this in here, I had to do the insert image trick five times, or insert it once and then copy and paste it in the other places. And so I would really rather put it in one place and not have it show up in a million places. So I'm gonna define rocket and here just like I can give a numeric value to a name I can give a graphical value to a name so I'm gonna say copy and then I'm gonna say paste and so I can define the rocket the word rocket to mean this little image and then I can replace all these instances of the rocket picture with the name rocket and in the same way that when it sees height, it replaces it with 100. When it sees rocket, it replaces it with our little dude. Oop. Okay, and so now, oops, I'm going to make this a little wider so we see all the parentheses. There we go. Now we've given a name to this image and then replaced the occurrences of the image with the name so they're in one place. Now if I wanted to change from a blue rocket to a red rocket or a little green UFO, all I would need to do is change the image here in the definition and the animation would all update accordingly. So let's go ahead and save that and we'll run it. And we still have a rocket and it comes down and it lands. Yay! Now, we've done arguably most of the simple things. There are a couple of other constants we could improve on. We've got 50, which is the distance across. It appears twice. And we have these twos that appear in three places. But for the moment, what I want to focus on is this expression. This expression occurs three times here, here, and here. And it's confusing. It's not obvious what that expression means. And by having it three times, not only do you have three places where you have to figure out what it means, but you also have to make sure it's exactly the same in all three places. So if you figure this out, and then you come across it here, you have to ask yourself, is it the same as the other one? And if it is, oh good, I finally figured it out. But if it's not, then I have to figure it out again. So it's a confusing expression. And giving it a name and moving it somewhere else means we only have to understand it once and the name will hopefully help make it clear what's happening. So what does this actually do? This computes 
the height to the center of the rocket. So this is the image height of the rocket divided by two is basically half the height of the rocket, which is the distance between the center of the rocket and the base. And that's important for deciding exactly when to land the rocket. Uh, and then subtracting that from height tells us where the middle of the rocket is when it's sitting right at the bottom. So if the height of the rocket was, say, 10, this is going to be 5. We subtract 5 from 100, if the height of the scene is 100. It gives us 95, and that tells us that the middle of the rocket should be sitting at the y-coordinate 95 when it's sitting right on the bottom of the scene. So we're going to go ahead and give that a name. And it's not the same name as the one used in the book, because I didn't find the one in the book to be very descriptive to me. I still had to figure stuff out. Um, and so I'm going to say height, and this is going to be a long, kind of tedious name, but, you know, there we are, of middle of rocket when landed. Okay, that's a very long name, but I'd rather err on the side of a long descriptive name than a short confusing name. So we're going to go ahead and go with this because this is the best thing I can think of at the moment. And now what are we going to define? What's the value of this? It's going to be that expression. So I'm going to grab a copy of that. Copy. And then I'm going to hit return because my name is so long that we want it to be on the next line. And boom. So we've defined the height of the middle of rocket when landed to be the difference between the height of the whole scene. Suggest that height is not a great name. It should be height of scene probably. Uh, minus half the height of the rocket. Okay. And now we can go and find all the occurrences of that expression and replace them with this long, exciting name. I will copy and paste so I don't have to type that all in again. Paste, select, paste, select, paste. Now, instead of having this weird expression that appears three times, I have height of middle of rocket when landed three times, all of which refer to this expression, which I only have to understand once. And if I get it wrong, if this somehow I've gotten the logic of this wrong, I only have to fix it in one place instead of having, instead of having to fix it in three. So let's run this and see if we still get our animation. Yay! Boom. And let's, just for fun, change the height to 200 to confirm that it works when we change the height and that everything updates accordingly. And down we go, and boom, the eagle has landed. Life is good. Okay. Now, the last thing I'm going to refactor is there are two occurrences of this empty scene, the width and the height. So I'm going to go ahead and give those a name as well. And so we'll define starting scene, which again is not the same as what they have in the book. Um, the book uses an abbreviation, which I think is not super clear. Um, and so I think starting scene is a better full name for that. And so we need to replace the two calls to empty scene with starting scene. And we'll run that and make sure that still works. And we're good. So, uh, and that completes the refactoring. We could give names to this and this. We don't really need to worry about giving a name to two anymore because it only appears once right here. We could do some things like call this half rocket height or something like that. Um, and we could come up with names for this, like um, horizontal position of rocket. Um, but I think you get the idea, and so I'm going to leave it at that. And if you wish to play with it some more, I would certainly encourage that. Um, and so it's also worth comparing where we ended up to where we had started. So if we look at the initial version of the code, we've got all these rockets, which are visually very distracting. Um, and all this repetition, 
for example, this being in multiple places. And now we have code that reads more cleanly and doesn't have little rocket symbols scattered around in it. I find that at some point having all this capitalization is a little annoying. It feels like the code's shouting at me which would make me wonder if I really wanted to use the capitalization for constants trick if I have a lot of constants. But, you know, I do think this code's a lot more readable than the code we started with. It's certainly much more maintainable than this code we started with. Um, and this is with a very small, simple program. You can imagine that with a larger, more complex program, doing this kind of refactoring could have really huge benefits and greatly improve our ability to maintain and work with the code. So that finishes this video up. Thank you very much. Talk to you later.